Hey guys, welcome to another edition of our Sermon Follow video. We're glad that you're joining us. This week we started a brand new series. We finished up the book of Acts uh, that we'd started in January and gone through three different series. This week we started a brand new and blessed summer uh, that'll take us through the rest of the summer and uh, we are very excited about it. So um, I'm going to ask Pastor Gordon to kind of give us a, a quick overview of this week. We, we kind of started at the end, which was very cool, and it'll all tie back together when we, when we get through the summer. Uh, but give us a little, uh, a little overview of this week's message, yeah. Yeah, it was a great morning. I really enjoyed uh, the opportunity to present, uh, to kind of frame up what's going to be the next several weeks of our series. The, the actual, the, the content of it is going to be the Beatitudes, those nine expressions that are found at the very beginning of Jesus' sermon in chapters uh, 5, 6, and 7, but in chapter 5, the Beatitudes, we know them so well, um, or we think we do. Let's put it that way, and it's, it's probably well worth our time to, to dig deeply into the, the richness of those nine expressions of blessed, blessed are you. Uh, and so we're looking forward to it, like Kyle said, and like it's, it's there on your uh, discussion sheet that we really began at the end, and uh, we, we started with the end in mind. And so ta teaching from Matthew 5, 17 through 20, where Jesus very clearly says that I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And then describes what I think is the, the most important verse in the entire Sermon on the Mount uh, is that chapter 5, verse 20, where he says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so that's a very, very important <laughs> verse to get our minds and our hearts around what on earth was Jesus saying because if, in fact, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees for that audience and Matthew's reading audience, um, it, would have been, it would have been derailing to them. How on earth could we ever enter into the kingdom of heaven? Well, so it's very important that we understand what righteousness really is and what happiness really, where it's really found. Uh, and so that was the heart of what we wanted to talk about this past week and launch into the series. Because these nine expressions are going to give us what does it mean to be happy and what is the reward for following after God in righteousness. Yeah, yeah, so. it's a great, it was a great launch of the, of the new series. So the first question we want you to jump in with is what are some common examples in everyday life of people trying to prove their own personal worth? And this comes right down to that whole my righteousness versus your righteousness versus Christ's righteousness and where does it all come together? Right. And I'm, I'm not opposed to um, friendly competition in life, friendly uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of it in one sense. Um, in fact, I think it's unfortunate that we have lost some of that element and we all get participation medals. Uh, in some ways, it's okay uh, that we, are, we look at the idea of competition. We have it in the sports arena. We have it in, um, in the entertainment industry. We have this idea of awards and honors that, that show that you have achieved something far above somebody else. Academics is another example. There, there truly are endless places. Uh, even our, our bank accounts and our, our um, uh, you know, how much we are worth, uh, literally, physically worth, how much, uh, how much is in our bank account, how, how many assets we have, all those kinds of things. There are endless occasions to compare ourselves to somebody else uh, and to be in competition for something. Uh, and, you know, when my, when my kids play soccer, um, I'm not a big fan of participation awards. You either achieved the greatness of winning or you didn't. Uh, and so, so there's a fine line between recognizing that, that there, there's friendly competition that exists out there, but to see it sort of overtake uh, the concept of what it means to have self-worth, what it means to have um, personal worth and trying to compare it one to another. So I'm sure in your group, and with, your, with the folks in your group, you're going to have no trouble kind of unpacking this and, and just recognizing the world in which we live and, and see it both from a positive and from the negative aspects. Yeah, yeah. Really and just be honest about it. You know, <laughs> so I don't compete at all. You're a liar. <laughs> just be honest about it. And, and a lot of them are ridiculous. You know, it's true. And, and, it's, and, and I think that, that's, part of the whole, that's part of the whole point of this. Right. Um, and then when you get into righteousness, you kind of see how that all fades away. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very, very cool. So the second question, how do we inside the church handle the same drive to prove and defend our worth? This is where, this is where the, the conversation starts to get a little squirmy. Right. Intentionally, that's a good thing. So yeah, inside the church, how do we handle that drive to, to kind of compare ourselves and, and defend our own value? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is where you take what's outside the church and it has been brought in. And this is not unique to just 
righteousness comparisons. This is unique to everything. I mean, we have the real challenge. The entire book of 1 Corinthians, for instance, the entire book of 1 Corinthians is about bringing the world or, or being careful not to bring the world into the church. Uh, that's, that's the whole heart of the book. And so we have, uh, you know, if, if there is such a thing as friendly competition, if there is a thing that, that we kind of, in a friendly way, in a, in a responsible way, measure success, uh, sadly what we have done is we have brought that into the church and, and, and placed it on the back of righteousness. Uh, to look at one another and to say, um, thinking that of the five or 600 people that are part of this specific church or of the church in general, the larger church, how are we doing in comparison to somebody else? And we need to get, we need to get straight that uh, when it comes to our personal righteousness, when it comes to our personal worth before God, we are comparing ourselves against the wrong individual or individuals. Uh, that is, uh, we will learn that quickly if we are willing to open ourselves up to the idea that uh, God makes very clear who we are measuring ourselves against, one another or somebody completely different than that, and, and that will come out yeah. very clearly. Yeah, so good. And, and part of why I think we, we we try to find someone to be the standard, you know, like usually we say, well, I'm the standard because we want to compare and we want ourselves to be the best, and then right. on that rare chance we find someone better than us. <laughs> We make them the standard, then we compare everyone else to them and wonder how much I am like them, when all of that is, is the wrong way to go. Obviously, Christ being the standard bearer and being yeah. the, the one that, uh, the only one that is truly righteous. And, but we do that. We bring, we bring kind of the world system, what we're taught, right? Get, get all, this is my old professor used to say, get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can, right? That was the guy <laughs> your old, and whoever is, ever heard that one. Yeah, I, I didn't make it up. <laughs> and, uh, and he'd say it with a southern draw, you know, so it's more powerful. But, but we, we get that image and we think, well, you know, he with the most toys wins. And then, right. and then we compare ourselves according to worldly standards. And, uh, and man, that's just so detrimental. It just, it breaks down the whole, the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, there's just no, uh, it just is more offensive, I think, to God than, than many other things. And that is that we are, it, it, it is opposing the gospel. It, it is an opposition to the gospel. The gospel is utter and complete surrender. It is, it is um, giving over this idea that I will ever measure up. Uh, and, and so then we come and we sit in a, a group, a room full of a few hundred other people, uh, and for some reason, something turns on us. Again, have we brought the world into it? Maybe that's part of it. Maybe it's just our own inclination that we are afraid of being um, we're afraid of surrendering that very thing. We're afraid of some, there's something within us. There's a drive within us that wants to prove ourselves to someone. And, uh, and it, is, it is in direct opposition to the gospel. Uh, and so when we come and we sit in a room full of a few hundred people or even in a, in a living room of a dozen people, we sit in there and we, we kind of ask ourselves, even so subtly and almost undetectably, we ask ourselves, so, so where do I rank among all of these folks? And that is clearly not what the gospel and not what God calls us as we measure our righteousness. That is not the standard. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to put it. Very cool. So the third question, and this one we want you to, we want you to really dig into, kind of camp on this. If, if this dominates the majority of your time, that's totally cool. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. This question is, is, if we really understood that our standard of personal righteousness is not in comparison to others but Jesus, how would that affect our interactions in the church? So all that we just talked about, if we got that, if we right. understood that, if we internalize that and use that as that foundation and that basis, how would it change everything else that we do? How would it change our interactions and, and the way we participate and the way uh, we do church, really? Yeah, I, I mean, this is just a continuation of it, as Kyle said. It just takes what we were just talking about and it, and it, and it turns for just a second and imagines speculating because sadly it's probably it needs speculation we don't have a lot of personal examples of this and we need more of them me included of, of to walk into it and go you know what Jesus is my standard he is my standard and so as I walk in and I live among people who are like me in that that Jesus is their standard of righteousness Jesus is my standard of righteousness there is no one that will ever walk in through the doors of this church or gather together whose standard is not Jesus. We all collectively have that same uh, measuring that we have to go up against. And so in speculation almost, what would it look like if each and every one of us came in and said, you know what, 
I'm, I'm here to measure up to Jesus. And what we'll walk away from is knowing that we can't. We, we cannot. And we all just get reduced down to the lowest common denominator. That, that's what, you know, in mathematics, that's the whole idea, right? Is let, let's all get down to that lowest common denominator where we're all kind of evenly split. We're, we're laid out very clearly. And the reason why we're collectively together, we're all in our lowest common denominator is because none of us measure up. It's not even how close do we get. Uh, Kyle uses that great phrase, what is it? If I can, what is it, jump or, or throw, you know, a lot better than you, I still, you know, I'll never, I'll never, it's not even, it's not even something that I can come close to and so stop trying um, to measure against another one, how closely we can get to the, the person of Jesus Christ. And so then we walk in, what does it mean? So then we walk in and our, our relationships are, we're all fellow beggars. That's all we are. We are all mutual beggars at the hand of a gracious God, you know, and so let's all be beggars together and stop trying to, one of us be the great giver over another, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's like two bags of garbage arguing over which one's most like the Hope Diamond. <laughs> right? I mean, that's... That just came to me. I don't have that skill. <laughs> I do not have that skill. That's what it is, though. <laughs> it's like, I'm a little less garbagey than you. You know, and not, and I don't mean... You know, I, I, I got to write that one down. Put that that next is week's fantastic. Yeah. Man, he's so good at that. I can't even... Two, two bags of trash. Two bags of trash, yes. Arguing, arguing over... Which is most like the Hope Diamond. That's pretty good. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That that may appear. Yeah, so. yeah. And it's not the garbage being like no of no value to God. Obviously, that's not what we mean. But it's like you know which one of which one of us um, bears the resemblance of of that which neither one of us bears the resemblance of on our own, so right outside of the Holy Spirit doing that in us. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how silly that would be for two bags of trash to have that ridiculous. conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, Edgar, I think. <laughs> Sounds like a good bag oh, of trash. Man. Man. How fantastic. <clears throat> All right, moving on. <laughs> Number four. Number four. Ooh. In what ways does utter failure in personal righteousness apart from Christ produce a happy life? And it's a, on, on the surface, that may be like, how? I don't, what? I don't know. How can me realizing that I'm terrible make me happy? Right. But there's a lot to that. Yeah, and that's, I, I was sharing with Kyle before we started the video, is that I, I did want to spend a moment on this simply because of what could appear as confusion. Not that it's the best question you'll ever have. It's the idea that I, I wouldn't want it to be misunderstood. Uh, and, and it probably isn't. Hopefully it isn't. That idea that if we are bags of trash, or if we are, you know, when we think of the comparison to one another, which is, a complete farce that we would compare to one another. It's a complete joke that we would ever do such a thing. Uh, and so we, we recognize that we are, in our, in, our, in our own effort, we are utterly unable to appeal to the righteousness that God calls as his standard. That's what the whole sermon was about. Well, not the whole sermon, but a, a big chunk of the sermon on Sunday was about, was the idea that, that we can't, that, that verse 20, chapter 5, verse 20, the whole point of that is unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, the whole idea was that, and, and then Jesus took it even further, and we talked about that, the, the examples that he gives later in chapter 5 demonstrate even more impossible than it is. The idea of adultery, rather than the active, uh, you know, participating in an adulterous act, it's, it's actually your heart engaging in lust, you have committed adultery. It's the, the righteousness is so far beyond that. So, so how on earth does that produce a happy life if we really understand that we are unable to achieve that righteousness? And I think it, it takes into account all of what Jesus has done for us. It says, let me, and, and we talked about it some on Sunday, let me take your righteousness, the ugliest of the righteousness, let me take it away and let me give you mine. And what could produce a happier life than to know, you mean I have Jesus' righteousness? Mm -hmm as my righteousness, that's it. What would make me happier? I mean, what could, that, that I know how much I fail and that's all been taken away and it's been given me the success, the perfect success of my savior uh, impugned to me for nothing of myself. And so now I live in obedience so that I might put on display his righteousness. And it will come up later in the series. I think actually Kyle will be teaching the week of uh, 13 to 16 where it says, let your good works shine. Let them shine. 
so that they will glorify not you, but your Father who is in heaven. You know, and so that's really where that happy life comes into play. Yeah, yeah it's a it's just it's a super important concept to get. You know, this idea of recognizing that our failures are are there, that I have no righteousness of my own, but that <clears throat> there's been a transfer. You know, there's been a swap there. It brings up freedom that that we don't have. We don't have to sit there and compare ourselves to other people and, and other people to to ourselves and, and that play that whole game uh, because we recognize that switch has been made. And, and the, the kind of meditation verse of this week sums it all up. And you might you might even want to read it at the beginning um, of your group time. Uh, and it's uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. And it just it shows mm-hmm. just a perfect picture of that swap that's been made. Yeah. Uh, your, your righteousness, which, which the Old Testament talks about as filthy rags, worthless. It's not actually righteousness. It's man-made. It's fake. And, and it's swapped with true righteousness, that of Jesus Christ. And so when he said, when he said you, your, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the scribes, right? there's only one person who that is true of, yeah. and that is Jesus. And that's so right. we have to have his righteousness. And that's what happens. And so it's a, it's a great, great thing. It's a good image. Hopefully you can catch that in your head there. I'm sure some of you will have almost parental um, examples. It, this is a very parent-child kind of picture that you can grab of, of you know, something that a child has sort of destroyed, <laughs> something that they have completely marred and muddied and, uh, and just torn apart. And, and a father comes in and takes that you know, and, and brings around and, and places a brand new of whatever that is in the hands of that child and says, I will take that which is torn up and muddied and soiled and worthless at this point in time. I will take that and I will give you a brand new one that can never be soiled because it comes not from you, but it comes it comes through my son and his will never be soiled. His righteousness will never be. And so um, absolutely, Second Corinthians 521, please, you know, use that, spend time in that because of its great value uh, to, to capturing these ideas. And, and we're going to continue that for the remainder of the series, we hope. so. Yeah, yeah very good. We hope it's a great week for you. Yeah. <clears throat> you guys sit around and talk about this, all your fellow bags of garbage, <laughs> along with me. And, uh, but it's going to be, yeah, it'll be a good, good week. There's some great stuff here, and we want to get off to a good start as we